Well, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to extend my uh, welcome to uh, all of you to the uh, balmy shores of Boise. Um, and uh, I uh, uh, gave uh, Maria Carmen some flowers because I had no idea when I signed up for this uh, what I was getting myself into in terms of doing the local arrangements. And uh, if it hadn't been for her luncheons and her sense of humor, um, uh, God knows where we would be having these meetings right now. So I also want to point out that both Roger Welsh and Guha asked if the flowers were for them. So uh, <laughs> we do things differently out west, but not that differently. So, OK. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Carlos Vélez Abanez. Um, Dr. Vélez Abanez concentrates his work on the southwestern United States, Mexico, and the Caribbean. His publications are numer numerous, including five books, three of which are based on original field research. And his grants are many from uh, National Science Foundation, NEH, and other private foundations. He's presently conducting transnational field research in two rural valleys in California and New Mexico and their sending communities in Mexico. He received a PhD in anthropology from the University of California at San Diego, uh, 1975. Later, he became professor of anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at University of California, Riverside, 1994 to 2005. Additionally, he was Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at University of California, Riverside from 94 to 99. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Vélez Ivanez is, is presently the Motorola Presidential Professor of uh, Neighborhood Revitalization, Professor of Transborder Chicana Chicano Studies, and Latina Latino Studies in Human Evolution and Social Change. Chair of the Department of Transborder Chicano, Chicana, and Latina, Latino Studies at Arizona State University, and Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at University of California, Riverside. And before I give the title of his talk, I'd just like to say that when uh, the first time that he and I communicated uh, about the invitation to come and address the American Folklore Society, there was just no hesitation whatsoever. He, he immediately wrote back and he said, you know, the reason that I like to talk to folklorists is that they, they not only ask good questions, but they also ask hard questions. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Vélez uh, Abanez, and the title of his talk is The Ethics of Institutions, Pitfalls of Engaged Folklore, and Tales from the Federal Courts. Dr. Vélez Abanez. Thank you very much. Uh, just two side stories. Uh, I always get a little embarrassed when I'm being introduced with you know, all titles and stuff. And it's really just an accumulation of years more than anything else. But it also reminds me of my Tia Julia. And every Mexican family has a Tia Julia that has an Aunt Julia. And that's that wizened individual who tells it like it is. And so when uh, earned the doctorate in 1975. As all Mexicans are wont to do, we had a fiesta. And uh, at my mother's house, and all my cousins came, and friends, and all that sort of thing. Just this big crowd of folks. And my mother, being very proud of her newly minted doctor, uh, went around saying, mi hijo el doctor, my son the doctor. So it's not just Jewish, you guys. It's also. <laughs> So, even though my, my mother's side of the family were Sephardic Jews, by the way. This is another side. Um, and so, this thing resonated through uh, in the backyard of my house next to the barbecue pit. Uh, doctor, 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 doctor. And then my tia Julia called me over. And she said, mijito, which means my little son. Si, tia. Yes, She says, eres doctor. Are you a doctor? I said, you know, I kind of hemmed and hawed, kind of, yeah, kind of, see, no, perhaps, maybe, you know. Uh, and then she said, pero como puedes hacer doctor tú? How can you be a doctor? Si ni sabes cortar callos, you don't even know how to cut corns. So how can you be a doctor? 
So every time I get introduced like this, I always remember my Tia Julia. <laughs> the other side is that, in fact, my first two courses that I took when I came back from the service at the University of Arizona was one course with Bird Granger. And some of you who knew Bird Granger and her famous Arizona place names and a number of other work that she did, and Frances Gilmore, who was uh, one of the stars of the entire universe in Mesoamerican studies. So I, I commiserate with you all. Uh, I'm kind of also a literary anthropologist because I also have a, a master's degree in literature. So I'm not just an, an unreconstructed empiricist. So I hope you know that. I recently read a, a wonderful article on the manner in which folklore has changed in terms of the subjects it treats because of global processes and the simultaneous unfolding for an engaged folklore, especially on the side of social justice. Maribel Alvarez states in her very informed piece that the tidiness that may have once enveloped the mystique of folk cultures as arenas of everyday life, where folks have, have found their bearings of unique identity and self-contained expressiveness, is gone. We don't have to look very far to substantiate this statement, like the Chuntaro music, based, in fact, on Cantinflas. These are chuntaras, and these are young uh, women in cholo attire right on the border between uh, Tijuana and San Diego. And their dance, in fact, is exactly like Cantinflas's was 60 years ago. So there's a, whole, there's a whole syncretism that, in fact, that's occurring out in that world, and especially in the border arenas that I deal with, syncretism in, in many, many different ways in relationships and in new ways of living, in new ways of perceiving things that, in fact, we're looking, when we look at culture in the border regions, we have to really think in multidimensional terms and as well as in, in terms of not single unique identities nor single unique personalities, but rather multiple, multiple cultural domains in which, which people have to handle on a daily basis. You also have to remember that just crossing the border alone, there are 30, 30 million people across back and forth on the US-Mexican border on a daily basis. That's a lot of people. Those are actual crossings, not people for crossings. And when you put together about a $25 billion uh, economic uh, situation, you see basically a highly centralized region now that the border has become a centralized region rather than a border, a place to stop anymore. So what is crucial to her argument is that folklore, because of global, transnational, migratory, and massive demographic changes, has more recently trained one of its foci on the politics of representation, the consequence of which states Alvarez. Folklore has played key roles in ensuring access, diversity, and inclusiveness. However, she also states that this dynamic has moved folklore and its multicultural allies towards the development of an emerging po politics of social, cultural, and economic justice. After a careful delineation of the many issues surrounding this dynamic, Al Alvarez calls to situate folklore to larger structural aspects of social policy, such as demographic change and human rights, among others. I think she's right, and folklore may contribute greatly to the identification of on-the-ground cultural and social issues too often missed by those most concerned with social and economic justice, and we'll see some of this later. I do have a caveat. The caveat that I have is that when one uses cultural information, especially in adversarial contexts within the juridical and judicial system, then all bets are off. And the reason for it is very simple. What basically we as cultural workers, if we want to use that term in order to transcend the differences between, between cultural anthropologists and folklorists, because we're all cultural workers in one way or another, is that the adversarial domain immediately allows us not to have any control whatsoever over processes that we, in fact, cannot predict. For the most, many of the cases in which anthropologists and social work and cultural workers have been involved in, many decisions have been based not on the, on the, on the efficacy of the argument, nor on the truth of the matter, if you want, but rather on the outcomes of the adversarial process that sometimes has little to do with truth and justice. So my only caveat is, is that once we get involved in these areas, there are, these are very dangerous waters for our crafts indeed. And in fact, 
What one sees too often within juridical con uh, context is in fact the tried and true hierarchies, ethnocentrism, racialism, sexism, and classism, and the prevailing modes at the time. Many times, these various contracts may be structurally ingrained, part of the underlying institutional mores, not admitted, but in fact by deep strict, uh, scripts of historically derived rationalizations and masked by procedural rationales and judicial caveats and rituals, too many times used in opposition to our intentions within the adversarial context. And again, I focus on the adversarial context as the place where we really have to be very careful. Even our best intentions to avoid these hidden dimensions with our expertise and our crafts of folklore, cultural studies, and anthropology may come to naught. For cultural practitioners, results may be profoundly disturbing and lead to totally unexpected outcomes, and in some cases detrimental to those which the cultural worker seeks to protect, explain, or support. I'd like to take you to, and then to two specific cases. The first case is one that occurred ex almost 30 years ago of the unconsenting sterilizations of Mexican women in Los Angeles in the case of Madrigal versus Quilligan. The case of Madrigal versus Quilligan was one in which I was strongly involved in as the cultural consultant. Two lawyers came to see me, in fact, in October of 1977, and they asked me to comment as to what I thought would be the result for women who were sterilized without their consent. What did I think of what kind of cultural impacts would these have? What kind of social impacts would these have? My response was basically if it very much depended on the women, where they came from, where their point of origin was, their age, and I'll over all the other variables and factors that one had to consider. And they asked me if I wouldn't do an analysis and a study of 10 women, in fact, who allegedly were sterilized without their consent. As I found, found out, in fact, most of the women, at least half of them, had signed consent forms. The only problem is, they didn't speak English. The second problem was they signed the consent forms in the middle of labor. Three of the women uh, who signed, in fact, were already drugged up and didn't know what they were signing. And for two of the women, their husbands signed. So that was a situation at the time that I entered the case. They suggested that, in fact, uh, what I suggested to them is that more than likely the more rural the context in which the women originated, the higher the probability that there was going to be a much larger focus by the women on childbearing as part of their social identity. The, the further away they moved from the rural area into more urban context, the higher the probability they were not going to be perceiving, perceiving themselves necessarily as having children as being the uh, best outcome for their lives. The field work, I conducted field work between 1977 and May, 19, uh, and May 30th, 1978. I looked at, the, the, at their social and cultural context. My, ma my main hypo hypothesis was at the time, and if you, 30 years ago, we were using the notion of subcultural groups because we didn't know how, how, the, how we were going to categorize people. Might be handy to capture any tendencies that might appear said that the rural, urban generation and origin, income, distribution, education, language proficiency, and religious beliefs might give me a handle as to where some of these women might tend towards. I distributed a small questionnaire after a few months regarding SES, place of origin, social networks, extent and extent, and did a complete genealogy of each household. I examined to the extent possible as many networks of relationships with which each woman was or had been associated. At each interview and observation, I was accompanied by, uh, in fact, the, the lawyer in the case, who was a woman, a young woman who had just finished UCLA about three years before. Since I could not do any comparative analysis of before or after, many of my questions were couched as if this had not happened, or quote, before this happened, or if there were indications that the women had participated in a variety of social activities, such as birthday parties, weddings, and other events, then I would ask before and after questions around those activities. These included the number of events attended, the nature of events, and the relationships of the women to those others in the other events. I also tried to confirm their responses with close relatives or spouse if he was available and apart from the physical presence of each woman. What did I find out? I found out, just in terms of 
sheer numbers. In fact, the average age of women was 32.6, with a range of between 24 and 39. At a 3.1 mean number of children, a mean income of $9,500 per year, which was the median family income for that of the total U.S. population. A mean education of 8.5 years, which for that time was 0.6 years below that of the median income of Mexican females in the United States. And stable housing and employment characteristics. In no way could a so-called culture of poverty or some kind of marginal label be applied to these women. My findings of just their social and cultural context and origins were that of the 10 women, nine had been born in small rural communities, such as in rancherias or ejidos in Mexico, and had been socialized in these contexts through age 14. In Mexico, these women had fulfilled agricultural chores from milking cows to planting and sowing corn, and depended, and depended on a strict division of labor in terms of household duties, but more importantly, had childcare functions for younger siblings and cooking for older male siblings. In other words, a very highly patriarchal system. Coming from most large families, so that the mean number of children in their family of orientation averaged 7.5 and their spouses' families, 9.5. Thus, the expectation for childbearing was more than likely a valued one, and one would expect a negative end cap from sterilizations. But the story really became more complicated by reference to their social networks of the past and present, and especially those that were disrupted, and in some cases ruptured as a consequence of the sterilization. In urban Los Angeles, in all cases, these women had constructed very dense Networks made up of fictive kinship, extended family networks, and dense friendship relationships. These cross-cut th cross spouses through compadrasco relationships. And women especially had extensive fictive kinship relations before the sterilization. All 10 women prior to sterilizations had extensive kinship ties to the four traditional religious observances, baptism, confirmation, communion, and marriage, as well as for those who had female children through quinceañeras. For two of the women who had four children, their compadres and comadres numbered a mean of 18 persons each, and of the 10 women, five had three extended generational ties. And this is what these looked like. If you were looking at individuals, these would be the multiple dyadic relationships with, between any two persons. So what you see, I'm sorry that you can't see it too well. Can you, can you um, is it me or is it, or is it the graphic? It's the graphic? Could you, could you adjust the graphic over here, please? Over here on this machine? Yeah, if you could, if you could bring up, see, see if you can make it a little tighter. No? It's as focused as it's gonna get? Okay. That's good, that's all right. If you see, each, each of these is a relationship that in fact is part of an exchange relationship just between two individuals. So that includes everything from consanguineal relationships to participating in tandas and I'll talk a little bit later about tandas or uh, rotating savings and credit uh, savings association. Uh, also they borrowed, they visited, uh, they, they, were, they baptized each other's children so you have these very dense ties and that's only between two people. Now when you multiply these out, you, you see actually almost a hundred or so ties between, let's say, 12 people. And these are very dense. And of course, the problem with dense relationships is that any, any of these strands, if they become ruptured, the other, the other strands also, also are, are uh, also vibrate, if you want to put it in that particular, in, in, in that nomenclature. But this was, this was the, the very typical relationships between individuals and certainly between the women and their relatives and their friends and very many significant others. All of these were in fact tied to what I call the ritual cycle. Now all of these relationships are articulated throughout the ritual cycle during the year. These are the major, the major ritual activities in which these women participated. And uh, many of these rituals, except uh, they begin about New Year's, they come about half of that, half of the cycle comes down here in Easter and then ends up over here in Christmas. Now between these two halves are all of these other very important life cycle rituals. And in between the life cycle rituals, there's a whole bunch of other social activities. Okay, that's everything from birthdays to Tupperware parties. So what you have here is that this ritual cycle is, is part of the glue as well as the platform through which all of these social exchange relationships are maintained and unfold at the same time. When one combines all the exchange systems of women and men, then the density of relationships was quite remarkable. And these included labor and material exchange as a caretaking of children. And by the way, that's the other part of this. Uh, 
I don't, no, I don't have it here. But in another graph that I have, what happens is that in all of these households, children get exchanged around the households. Okay, there, there's caretaking duties in different households. So that children, in fact, emerge very different from uh, non-Mexican children. They emerge, in fact, in very, in very thick social context. And I'm not going to get into some comparative studies that we did of that, but we pretty well substantiated that, in fact, Mexican children will usually grow up with more relationships with the same person than more relationships with others. So they're ne never alone. But the socialization interaction between mom and, and the neonate is, in fact, exactly the same between uh, non-Mexican and, and Mexican mothers. Uh, what's different is these thick relationships. Household, vi household visitations among most of these networks were frequent and intense, with sleepovers for children, caretaking by many others other than the parents, and a kind of exchange circle of children, of course, occurred. Thus, in essence, the cultural and social capital that had been present according to the best information possible was a highly adaptive one given the economic circumstances, material wealth, and so on. Two great values emerged from the study and what I had looked at previously in central Mexico. The two great values, the first value being confianza, which is mutual trust, which is part of the articulation of the social exchange relationships between people. And the second one is sentido familiar. And sentido familiar basically is an expression of the willingness of persons to have children to continue the lineal relationships uh, over the long term. So those are the two basic values that were very much a part and parcel of, of this system. The aftermath, what I found in fact was great, great terrible levels, of, tragic levels of social disengagement. Most of the women had gone through a process of social disengagement beginning with a husband-wife dyadic relationship. Two of the husbands remained highly supportive of their spouses and no appreciable damage seemed to have resulted in the relationship. One of the two husbands, however, com compensated for the loss of his wife's ability to appropriate by showering her with gifts at most inopportune times. The other remained a saddened but not bitter male who consoled his wife and was extremely supportive. The other eight relationships to different degrees suffered ir irreparable damage. Three couples filed for divorce. The other five relationships were marked largely by jealousy, suspicion, and in two cases, physical violence and abuse. Jealousy and suspicion arose in three of the husbands due to the change they perceived in their political control over their wife's sexuality. Basically, they feared that their wives would avail themselves of their sterile, st sterile state. Mothers and children, <clears throat> for eight of the ten women, these relationships also shifted. Physical punishment of children had increased to the point that in at least five of the, of the cases, children sought to remove themselves from their mother's presence at every opportunity. Children themselves had begun to express anger to their own siblings, so that sibling conflict had also increased. Aggression between mothers and their children and between siblings shifted the qualitative relationship from affection and nur nurturance of fear and violent reaction. So what was ruptured simultaneously, of course, was also the ritual cycle because, in fact, women refused to participate in the ritual cycle any longer because, in fact, many, many of them were asked why, why weren't they having more children. And they acknowledged, in fact, it was much easier not to attend these functions than it was to answer the questions. Now, as the aftermath of this, I'll get back to that. And here are the five. There was also a consulting psychiatrist on the case, and he, using normative, uh, exa uh, normative, um, what's the word that I want? Not examinations, but normative, like the MPPS. Anyway, nor normative standards. Uh, he gauged the level of depression for, for each woman. I gauged the level of social disruption and rupture and social in engagement of each of the, of, of the women. And we built a scale, and these were blind. I built a scale, from, and we had a 10-point scale. And then I distributed the women according to what I perceived as the highest level of social disruption and network disengagement. And then he, his scale was from the highest to lowest in terms of depression. Our, the co correlational relationship was 0 .005 between the highest levels of depression and the highest levels of disruption with the lowest levels of disruption with the lowest level of depression. So we were able, in fact, to support the theses that, in fact, uh, these women suffered very greatly as the aftermath. We went to court. The legal case, I'll skip the trial itself and go to the heart of the matter. 
<clears throat> the heart of the matter is that the judge in federal court refused the testimony of the consul consulting psychiatrist. He refused the testimony of one of the physicians who, in fact, uh, testified that uh, the doctors didn't pay very much attention to consent forms or to much of anything else. And also that there was a relationship between the training of interns during the cycle of their, uh, of their uh, the time in which they, they were spending their training in gynecology, there was also an increase in the number of, of uh, sterilizations at, at the same time. And his testimony was discounted uh, and the judge said that his testimony, quote, completely defy common sense. Didn't make any difference whether it was true or not. Now, he reduced everything down to what he regarded was as a failure to communicate. Anybody remember the movie with uh, the famous sheriff and um, what's his name? Cool Hand Luke. This is merely a failure to communicate. The case essentially is essentially, according to his comments, are the following. Quote, this case is essentially the result of a breakdown in communication between the patients and the doctors. All plaintiffs are Spanish-speaking women whose ability to understand speaking English is limited. The fact is generally understood by the staff at the medical center, and most members have acquired enough familiarity with the language to get by. In other words, they speak what they, they, they described as gynecological Spanish. There is also an interpreter available whose services are used when thought to be necessary. But even with these precautions, misunderstandings are bound to occur. Furthermore, the cultural background of these particular women had contributed to the problem in a subtle but significant way. According to the plaintiff's anthropological expert, they are members of a traditional Mexican rural subculture, a relatively narrow, and by the way, I never used that in court, a relatively narrow spectrum of Mexican people living in this country whose lifestyle and cultural background derives from the lifestyle and culture of small rural communities in Mexico. He further testified that a cultural trait which is very prominent with this group is an extreme dependence on family. I didn't say that either. I described these as exchange networks. Most came from large families and wished to have large families for their own comfort and support. Furthermore, the status of women and her husband within the group depends largely upon the woman's ability to produce, produce children. If for any reason she cannot, she is considered an incomplete woman and is apt to suffer a disruption. And her relationship with her family and husband when faced with the decision of whether or not to be sterilized, the decision process is a much more traumatic event with her than it would be with a typical patient. Consequently, she would require greater explanation, more patient advice, and greater care in interpreting her consent than persons not members of such a, a subculture would require. At this point, I'm thinking to myself, we're home free. He continues, but this need for such deliberate treatment is not readily apparent. The anthropological expert testified that he would not have known that these women possessed these traits had he not conducted tests in a study which required some 450 hours of time. He further stated that a determination of him based on any less time would have been useless. It is not surprising, therefore, that the staff of a busy metropolitan hospital, which has neither the time nor the staff to make, it, to make such esoteric, esoteric studies, would be unaware of these atypical cultural traits. It is against this backdrop, therefore, that we must analyze the conduct of the doctors who treated the plaintiffs in this case, and so on. Since these operations occurred between 1971 and 1974, and were performed by the doctors operating in a busy obstetrics ward, it is not surprising that none of the doctors have any independent recollection of the events leading up to the operations. And they all testified, of course, they couldn't remember. They all testified, however, that it was their custom and practice not to suggest a sterilization unless the patient asked for it or there were medical complications, which sterilizations unless, I'm sorry, which would require the doctor in the, ex in the exercise of prudent medical procedures to make such, such a suggestion. They further testified that it was their practice when the patient requested sterilization to explain its irreversible result, and they said they would not perform. And of course, none of the, the doctors spoke Spanish. The operation, unless they were certain in their own mind that the patient understood the nature of the operation and was requesting the procedure. The weight to be given to such testimony and the inter, inter, inferences to be drawn, therefore, will be, term, de, be determined in the light of all the testimony relating to the doctor's conduct. His conclusion. The case has not been an easy one to try, for it, has, for it has involved social, emotional, and cultural considerations of great complexity. There is no doubt that these women have suffered severe emotional and physical stress because of, of these operations. One can sympathize with them for their inability to communicate clearly, but one can hardly blame the doctors for relying on these indicia of consent which appears to be unequivocal in their face and which are in constant use in the medical center. 
that the judgment be entered for the defendants. Signed, Jesse W. Curtis, Senior United States District Judge, June the 8th, 1978. The second case is Paloma. 30 years later, I promised myself after I participated in this thing, I was never going to touch another legal case uh, again. As a matter of fact, uh, for two years, I suffered from depression as the aftermath of, of the first case. And the depression that I had was uh, nothing compared to what the women suffered for the, for the rest of their lives. However, in this particular case, I, I kind of allowed my arm to be twisted. And this gives then uh, an example, this provides you also an example of the way in which information and folk, folklore, the folklore of people can either be misused or also, in this particular case, ignored to a certain point, but ignored for an entirely different reason that I'll, that I'll get to. Shelley Newman, in fact, was the lawyer of the case. That's a pseudonym. All of these are pseudonyms in which she asked me to uh, testify uh, in a case of a woman, woman by the name of Paloma Rivera who had been, in fact, uh, arrested for money, for money laundering. Now, during her interview with Paloma, she had stated over and over and over and over again that the reason that she was able to accumulate the money that she did was through tandas or cundinas. Now, tanda or cundina is this. A tanda or cundina is a rotating savings and credit association in which people put in, you can put any amount, let's say $10, and here you have a whole number of folks. Each one of these individuals every week, one of these individuals will get the, amount of, the total amount of money that the others put in. And so it rotates all the way around. And these are worldwide. These are in Africa, these are in the Caribbean. Uh, they're all over. The, in, in, as a matter of fact, in, in, in uh, New Jersey, there's a, an Isuzu a Kundina uh, Rotating and Savings and Credit Association is made up of, of uh, Africans, and Caribbeans, and Mexicans who have migrated to New Jersey. And so you have these in operations all over the place. Now, for about three months then, I was able to, I, I worked with, with, uh, with Paloma as the aftermath of Shelley, trying to find out of how these tandas, tandas would contribute to the acquisition, to her acquisition of resources. And she had read a book that I had published in 1983 on the, on the topic and on the subject. So she called me, in fact, to do a number of, of what I would call a forensic calculus of wealth that Paloma had acquired over a period of time. Because, in fact, when Paloma was arrested, she had owned a secondhand 2000 Mercedes sedan a Cadillac Escalade, a 2000 Lincoln Navigator. At the time of her, of her arrest, and I really want you to remember this, she was wearing a 24 uh, gold carat necklace and chain matched by two heavy gold bracelets and almost $5,000 in her purse. All was confiscated. A federal grand jury indicted her as a co-defendant with four others in a variety of drug charges. After a series of motions made by the defense attorney, she was separated from the others and charged solely with conspiracy to launder money. Allegedly through land transaction with one of the four defendants, remember his name, Mario Garcia. By the way, that's also a pseudonym, but it's really the name of a friend of mine who's in the history department at another, <laughs> at another institution. <laughs> so when he sees this, he's going to choke. This is, this is part of a book. I'm going to send him one with <laughs> with a chapter, underlined. <laughs> Essentially, this indictment emerged from her agreeing to partner with Garcia in the purchase of, or of, of an Oregon cherry orchard, allegedly using drug money, and according to the charge for the purpose of growing marijuana. All right, so that's basically the charge. All that stuff was confiscated. So then I had to find out, how did you become successful using tandas? Now, I cannot possibly in the, in the few minutes that we have, give you all of these, the entire calculus between the time that she came to the United States in 1990 and 1996 when she was arrested. But basically, Paloma is uh, a very interesting individual. 
Her father was a brutish poor farmer who abused Paloma's mother throughout most of their marriage. They moved from a terrible rural environment in Michoacan to Mexico City. And there Paloma went to middle school. She got a job in a bakery where her violent and abusive father worked as a guard. What he's saying about Paloma's economic and social behavior is that during her time in the bakery, this is in Mexico City, she held down two shifts from 6 a.m. to 2.30 2 p.m. and from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. Now that kind of just suggests to you what Paloma is about. I mean, she worked, she worked constantly. She also participated in a number of these tandas, or these rotating credit associations. And these rotating savings and credit associations, what she did is that she's a magnificent accountant because she was able to figure out when one ended and where another one, the other one started. So she was sometimes engaged in as many as four and five of these pandas at the same time with these contributions rotating. So when they hit, it was her turn, she was able to pay off another rotating credit association and then another one would hit and she was able to pay off the one previous to that and, and she could keep the calculus together of at least four to five of these rot rotating savings and credit associations at the same time, two of which she organized herself. So she had this marvelous accountant's mind. She was able, through these pandas and condinas, as well as her hard work, in fact, to buy a house for her mother and to escape her brutish father. She paid 25,000 pesos for it. And she lived, the, the entire family, her, she took all of her brothers and sisters, and there were, I think, 15 of them all together. And they all lived in, in Mexico City for a long period of time. Her brother moved from Mexico City to California in 1982. She then joined her, bro her brother in 1990 and worked, at, it, as a matter of fact, in three jobs. She worked as a waitress, she worked in the fields, and she also worked in a packing house. And at the same time, she participated in these rotating credit associations. Right. Now, by 1990, she and her brother had been able to acquire enough capital for them to, in fact, to buy their first house as well as she married a Chicano, which automatically gave her residency, and also gave her access to social services that she wouldn't have had otherwise. She also handled all of her husband's money. So she, she, took, she was basically the accountant of the household. By accumulating, by having all of these jobs, as well as utilizing his, or rather her husband's income, as well as shortening the chicken albondigas with more vegetables and less chicken, she was able to cut down on the amount of money that she spent on groceries on her husband. Right? And she was able to accumulate that in a pot of money that she set aside. With her brother, she was able then to buy a house with a down payment of $4,000, and which they paid $80 each paid and they also had a brother and another cousin move in and then a couple of other relatives into the household and each one of them paid $80 a month. So in fact, they were able to pay off most of her, uh, most of the mortgage payment every, every month. She bought furniture for the bedrooms and living room as well as appliances and opened her first Sears credit card account. She was well on her way to success. She also sent money to her sister Lola so that she could hire a coyote to cross her into Brawley from Mexico, which she did. And she almost, she simultaneously continued to send money to her mother. Now, more pathways to success. What she was able to do within a period of five years is to do the following. Buy three homes, a triplex, and each home that she didn't live in, and even in the home that she lived in, she would rent to four individuals who were working in the agricultural fields at about $80 a month. So you figure in a, in a three bedroom house and she occupied one bedroom, two bedrooms were occupied by eight people times eight, that's how much? $640 a month. And then the other two houses in the triplex, she also collected a similar amount of money by packing folks into, into one bedroom. She also in fact made money by in fact giving them all launches. That is, she made breakfast for all of these folks and sold it to them, and then they would meet out in the fields where she worked as well. All right. So she did all of this simultaneously. All of this. All right. Now, 
As I said, I can't go through all of this for the simple reason it's just, uh, it's, it's impossible. She hit, however, on one very particular money-making scheme which you will adore. And here it is. She, she met a friend of hers, uh, uh, she, she met a person by the name of Margarita who sold gold chains, uh, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and the rest. So what she did was to find out that in fact she, uh, her friend bought uh, this gold jewelry in Los Angeles. So she went to Los Angeles with two checks. One for five thousand, two for each one for five thousand dollars. She bought five thousand. She bought ten thousand dollars worth of jewelry. Gave the man the two checks. One of the five thousand dollar check was good. The other one would bounce if it were cashed. So they worked out a deal that he wouldn't cash it until three months from there. So she goes back to Brawley, sells the ten thousand dollars worth of jewelry for twenty thousand dollars. And this is on a daily basis over a period of three months. And then, of course, the guy, the jeweler in Los Angeles is able to cash the second check for $5,000. She nets how much? $10,000. Now, she did this over a period of time, over a period of four years. So she was able to accumulate sufficient capital and also utilize, in fact, her credit now acquired with, with the three houses and the, and the triplex. Uh, to buy the cars that I just suggested to you, as well as, however, to buy property in Brawley for $160,000. Now, she took that money, sold the property, made $80,000 on the property, and with that money, she purchased then uh, the following. She borrowed on a line of credit $99,000 and what was left from refinancing two other houses. She was able to purchase a trailer in Oregon for $85,000, paying $72,000 down. And she also made a down payment on a cherry orchard. When taken all together from all sources of income, including rental selling of gold jewelry, working two or more jobs, and participating in tandas with two or four, two or four times a year, it is very clear that between 1990 and 2006, Paloma had been able to parlay very limited resources into position of real returns on her investment. She achieved this utilizing her hard work, ingenuity, and available capital resources from all sources. Clearly, she had established this pattern in Mexico years before. Up to this point, she was well on her way to success. And in that same year, a federal attorney indicted her for money laundering along with four other defendants. At almost every interview, one constant theme emerged. Paloma believed that all of her economic activities were for her two children's welfare. She stated incessantly that all of the sacrifices she had made were so that her children did not want for an education, home, clothes, food, amenities, and certainly that they could enjoy all the comforts of middle class living. Rolling tears, sobbing spasms, and her head shaking from side to side only served to support what she reiterated, reiterated over and over again. She had worked so hard just to make sure that her family was safe and did not have to worry about the future. In fact, Paloma had experienced it. No, it began as a prayer, the most translated and performed song in the world began as a prayer. In welcoming you, I leave you with this prayer. It's a world of laughter. It's a world of tears, urban area. And the many tiny enclaves that surround and compose this urban area when you choose to interact with the peoples and cultures that call a place like this, I mean, uh, amphetamines across the border, selling them in the United States. So he was into his own business, and the feds caught up with him. Now, so what occurred that when she decided to buy this cherry orchard with Mario Garcia, she signed a document, and her signature showed that in fact they paid $150,000 for the cherry orchard. However, she hadn't acquired the money that she had borrowed yet, so Mario Garcia went ahead and paid for everything. And then later she paid him back. On the other hand, the feds didn't know that. She thought that they thought, in fact, that she was involved with Mario Garcia in laundering money by purchasing this cherry orchard. The indictment of the four defendants, including Paloma, alleged that she was part of a large-scale drug, drug importation ring headed by Mr. Garcia, who was also a member a number, who had a number of businesses in Brawley. 
The money is resulting from drug sales explain not only his wealth, but also Paloma's accumulated wealth. Thus, all of her homes, automobiles, jewelry, and cash, as well as, it, as any accounts with money were confiscated, everything. And her children were forced to live with relatives. Her common law husband, by the way, she had divor divorced her Chicano husband because she said he had no balls. <laughs> and so she took up with, <laughs> if, you, if you would see her, she's about five foot two, weighs maybe 92 pounds. That's it. But she's, as we say in Spanish, chiquita pero muy grande, which, which means she's very small but very big. Um, Thus, all her homes and her common law husband, who was an undocumented Mexican citizen, was arrested at the same time as she was, and he was quickly deported. So she lost everything. For six months, Shelley introduced evidence and was able to show that, in fact, Paloma's wealth was, was earned in the matter I have described. The, now, here's what's interesting. The attorney, however, did not introduce the information on the tandas. Additionally, a, few, a forensic economist supported the findings how she had leveraged her holdings to accumulate the monies to buy the cherry orchard. This and other evidence presented to the judge be before the trial allowed Paloma to be separated from the others. The federal attorney initiated a plea bargain, and in the process of developing it, Shelley consulted with a prominent judge from another district who advised that given the backlash against immigration and all the negative attention being given the border, that it was going to be impossible for Paloma to get a fair trial in the Southern California region. So, Shelley and Paloma made the decision to enter a guilty plea. The plea bargain required that Paloma would, lead, would plead guilty to one count of misprison of a felony. What that means is that basically you're hiding a crime. It's really from the French. This involved her admitting her guilt by acknowledging that she knew money laundering was taking place, but she did not report it. It also included the port port portifature Forfeiture, excuse me, forfeiture of her part of the cherry orchard, two of her homes in Brawley, her land purchase in the same community, and all of her automobiles. The government magnanimously agreed that she could farm and harvest the cherry crop in the year of her release and keep the income. However, she was forbidden to seek any loans for the purposes of purchasing land or homes during her probation of five years. What finally became of her purse and its $5,000 and 24 gold carat, uh, carat gold bracelets and necklaces? The purse was found, but evidently the valuables, ha the valuables had been distributed among a number of local, state, and federal arresting agencies, finders, keepers. She received a sentence that was equivalent to her time served and a probation for the number of years already said. Her residency in the United States was not compromised. Her admission of guilt reads as, as follows, written in printed letters and in Spanish and translated here and slightly amended to mask the identity of the judge. Mr. Judge, my name is Paloma Rivera. I only want to ask your forgiveness for what I did because I only wanted to invest. Because I'm a hardworking woman, I only thought of the best way of giving a better future to my children. Sincerely, Paloma. She had become partially successful for, for a price that she could not have imagined. But there is one last anthropological tidbit to chew on. None of my, my Tanda findings were presented before the judge, either when the decision was handed down to separate Paloma from the other defendants or during the plea bargaining. From Shelley's point of view, the concepts of tandas and rotating savings and credit associations would not be accepted because of their cultural foreignness and lack of an American reference. And in my words, their culturally organized relations based on confianza and not a highly stereotypic individualized value of personal achievement. This is the great contradiction in that Paloma's individual success is due to her communal participation in tandas. But this practice cannot be presented as a defense because it's culturally too foreign for either prosecutor or judge to understand. As for Paloma, she learned a hard lesson in that sacrificing work for her children had not helped them. She vowed to spend much more time caring for them and keeping them happy inside of their extended families. In the final analysis, these non-success domains together with their possible slanty features and density of relationships are the only mostly predictive arenas for emotional success in human contact. As for Shelley, she wrote to me, quote, so thank you again, my friend, for your assistance in this case. I don't know if we got absolute justice, if such a thing can be got in our current system, but we did significant damage control. I think she will be fine. I know she'll have no problem on probation, unquote. In conclusion, both cases present us with a specter of the manner in which our work can be misused or ignored when it counts. For in fact, we as either folklorists or as cultural workers are just as helpless most of the time as the clients or persons that, are, that we purport to help in judicial cases. 
That is, we cannot predict in the first instance how either our information analysis will be used, sorted, or characterized by what I would call the lay judge or the lay judicial settings with all of their specific cultural systems in which they operate. Therefore, every such engagement and practice is filled with pitfalls, the consequence of which we can neither control nor peek into a probable future. Thank you very much. Am I supposed to bounce back questions? Where's uh, Robert? Where are you? Yeah. Did I get as depressed on the second case as I did the first? Yeah. Yeah. Come over here. Oh, please. Can you step up the microphone, please? Test, test. So we heard a great deal in the early part of um, the presentations today about the importance of using folklore for social justice, about the way that our discipline is moving towards advocacy. And I listened to your talk tonight, and a part of me went, so much for folklore and social justice, so much for advocacy. What would you say to that? No. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. The, the context was the adversarial domain in which the, the entire system is outside of our hands. Uh, advocacy for social justice has to, has to continue. Uh, and advocacy has to be part and parcel of our everyday goals and, and missions. My only caution is, is that when we get involved in juridical procedures and in those domains, where the court has all of these cultural systems and operations that either we don't know, we don't understand, we don't have an experience with them, and we are really the rubes of the room, regardless of our knowledge about the populations with whom we work. That adversarial context is what I'm referring to. Uh, and that's my cautionary uh, note to, to all of us here. The, that I've learned the hard way that, as Shelley said it very well, there's no absolute justice. And if anything, if you're dealing with populations that are subordinated, that are exploited, too many courtrooms are made up of both judges and juries that reflect an entire, entirely different premise for social justice of populations who are so subordinated. As the judge pointed out in not wanting to take Paloma's case to a jury because of the intense anti-immigration um, hysteria. Uh, in Southern California as well. I mean, I, I'm coming from Arizona, you guys, so le let me tell you, it's tough. It's really tough. I've had five of my students deported, all of whom were raised in Phoenix, since they were aged three years old, two of them didn't know how to speak Spanish. One of them was, um, uh, one of the kids, was, in fact, was the president of the senior class. So this is happening right now. And these kids have led American civil lives. So we've got to have to, we have to start looking at this whole business of citizenship in a very, very different kind of way. The notion of cultural citizenship is certainly one alternative. But the other aspect of this is that we have to really talk about people le uh, leading American civil lives. I mean, these kids uh, were in Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, uh, played basketball, football, the whole business. Uh, one of them was an all-star in, 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 in baseball. And we have to face this every day. I know you had time constraints, but I'm just curious who or 
how is the judgment call made that you as an expert witness would not be, I don't know, willing to risk, I don't know if that's the proper term, um, the chance that you couldn't explain the tanda to a judge. I mean, what's so difficult about the concept? If many people in this room perhaps were never familiar with it, but by the end of your talk, we pretty much know what you're talking about. Why are we so sure that that would prejudice the case and that you couldn't make a judge understand? I'm, I'm, I might be missing something. Because most of you are folklorists. It's, it's, it, there, there is, if you look, if you, if you fundamentally understand the context in which Paloma had to function with the high levels of hysteria, especially uh, anti-immigrant hysteria in that context, uh, and knowing the judges. And by the way, that's the suggestion of, of doing the plea bargaining came from another judge in the same district. The judge assigned to the case was a very peculiar person, not unlike Judge Curtis. So we knew already going into it that this was going to be an uphill battle. The only reason this case changed was because the federal attorney decided to do the plea bargaining because she started understanding, not from my work, but from the forensic accountant's work, that in fact it was, it was possible for her to have earned that money. But to then insert this kind of exotica, if you want, would kind of cloud the, the issues from, from her perspective. Yes, ma'am. No. No, it's not a pyramid. No. No. No, it's not only it's not only it's not a pyramid. Okay, see let, let me explain to you. See, a pyramid is where folks who are putting in money at the bottom are giving people money at the top, and they're not getting anything in return. In this, in this particular case, everybody is getting the same amount of money that they're putting in. The difference is they're getting an accu accumulated sum. So when you get an accumulated sum, let's say that you have a tanda of $100 a month over a period of 10 months. Uh, one month, you're going to get $900. You take ni that $900 and you invest it in something, or you pay off a loan or whatever it is. That's why it's not illegal, because what you're doing is you're getting exactly back what you put in. You're not making any money on it. It's, it's a savings and it's, it's a, it's, it really truly, truly is a savings and credit association. But, but it's all done through confianza. It's all done through mutual trust. Why couldn't it be put in the context of microcredit or microfinance, yeah, which same. is very well established and right. very well known? Why wasn't it put in that kind of con context? Well, because then you'd, you'd have to go really far afield You'd have to explain all about microfinancing, uh, and that is just, from Shelley's point of view, would cloud the entire process again. From her particular point of view, it was much easier to do the plea. In a perfect world, I think that would have been the case. In this particular case, because of the context and the judge, it wouldn't have made any difference. That's why. That's why I say when you when you when you look at the. At some of these domains, many of these judicial domains have the same racist, ethnocentric, sexist, classist positions as any other part of, of living. Yeah. And in this particular case, it was pretty predictable. No, see, this is 30 years ago. Yeah, this is 30 years ago. Uh, so so these women, all these women were living in Los Angeles. Yes. You raised some very good, uh, a very good point at the, at the end of your presentation about, you know, kind of 
the need, if you're going to be going into that environment, to understand the culture of that environment, of the judicial system. Um, I have recently found myself in the judicial system and really took the anthropological uh, you know, eye to see how any kind of justice was going to happen in this situation you know, with young African American males in a in a courtroom of you know that was clearly the the cards were stacked against them, um, and I didn't see too much hope for the kids in the, in that sort of situation. But what do you suggest? I mean, our field has a lot to give to that field. Get the best lawyer possible. Get the best lawyer possible, really do your homework on the judge. It, that's key. If you get your best lawyer, I mean, the, the drawback that we had in the 1970s cases, these, 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 these lawyers were as young as I was. I was a brand new assistant professor at UCLA. These were newly minted lawyers coming out of, out of UCLA as well. One of whom became very prominent, in fact, the, the head of the National Council of Raza later on, Antonio Hernandez. But at that particular point in time, they're still neophytes. And although they worked their butts off on this thing, we all worked hard. It was all pro bono. All of this stuff has been pro bono. But again, it's, you've got to have crackerjack lawyers, and you really have to research your judge. A change of venue is very important, for example, as a tactic. And, and that's, that's an imperative. So there, are, there is wiggle room. You're speaking on an individual case, and in the case that I was observing, one family did that, and they hired a crackerjack lawyer, and that made that lawyer was so out of sync with the rest of that courtroom that it made the ruling on the kids far worse than if the kids' families had used a lawyer um, that you know was court appointed and you know, knew the culture of that particular classroom. But I guess my, my question isn't so much on the individual case, because I'm sure in some cases it would not have turned out in the way that the case that I witnessed did, but on kind of the, on a larger, I, I want to move to a larger arena to mm -hmm. look at it in the, you know, the field with the field, or yeah. society, or policy, or some other level. Well, I, I think I, part, part of it has to do with we as, as cultural workers um, becoming more knowledgeable. That's one part of it. But also utilize some kind of mechanisms, especially at the association level, which would be good at, at, at this association level, of interacting with, for example, legal domains so that each other's language starts becoming a little closer, or at least equivalences are being created between each other. If not the same, but at least equivalences. So that you can have at least a common, a common discourse, rather than this discourse over here and this discourse over here. They're two entirely, they're two entirely different domains, and never the, the, the twain shall meet. And that's part of the issue, that's part of the problem. We have this highly esoteric, exotic judicial system with its own language and with all the premises and everything else, uh, and all the case studies that's done, uh, in depth, uh, and we, we have to deal with those hundreds of years of quote unquote tradition. Well, that very tradition does kids like this in. So, our, our critical sense has to remain. And now, is there an easy panacea? No, I don't have one. All we have to do, we have to keep on trucking. I'll be damned if I'm going to quit. You have time for another one? Sure. I believe it was in 1985 in the Fresno District Court, there was a People versus Moi, where a Hmong man was charged with raping a young woman. He had been uh, a recent immigrant where she'd been there for a while. And his defense was, uh, we, we've known as a cultural defense, where uh, it was a custom that he was used to and his intent was not to do wrong. Uh, my question is that that cultural defense was acknowledged and accepted, yet he was found guilty because he didn't understand our law. I think the bigger issue that I'm trying to raise here is, uh, in your case, 
do you think that the cultural defense was not was ignored because of the wave of uh, resistance to uh, uh, current immigration patterns? Could you put that case into a larger uh, context of cultural defense uh, around the U.S.? There, the, the, in that particular case, it's also the other half of it, and that is the harm uh, on the young woman who was the victim of the, of, the, uh, of the rape. So from the point of view of the victim, there is no cultural license on being abused and victimized regardless of, cult, of the cultural context in which we place the specific act in, there's still a violence against a human being. It's like picking out, taking out a club and hitting it. There's no difference between the two. To the victim, this is not a victimless crime. This, there was an individual who was actually uh, abused uh, and, and violated. So regardless of the cultural system put that the and I'll use the police term, the perpetrator he used. Regardless of the cultural understanding, there was a victim involved. And that victim also had, had the right then to be defended against such abuse, regardless of what it was. And that's very different, however, when you're dealing with this kind of case, in which the judicial perception that is the arresting authorities couldn't believe, regardless of how you explain this, could not believe that that Mexican woman could do all that. Bottom freaking line. They could not believe it. See, that's very different. And they couldn't believe it. Why? Well, because there's an anticipatory racialism and sexism involved simultaneously in the two. How could that dumb Mexican do that? Why? Well, in part, the larger frame for that is that Mexican populations have perennially been perceived as commodities to be bought and sold, and when not wanted, thrown back across the border. So that larger commodity identity is part and parcel of, I would call, the American discourse about Mexicans. And it, it's, it becomes distributed in real events like this. So it doesn't matter how much you explain it or how, how rational you are in your approach, that larger commodity identity frame is in operation. And it's an operation, oops, it's an operation in the schools, it's an operation in judicial settings, it's an operation in economic matters, in banks, I mean, you name it. That's, that, it's an operation. Uh, if, if, you look, if you look at the, at the sentencing of Mexicans versus non-Mexicans for the same crime, same thing with African Americans. There's a differentiation for the same thing. Or an over-sentencing for a crime that's even less. Yeah, a, a, a less serious. So that, that commodity framework is, emerges, and, and nobody likes to talk about it. it, it emerges out of the American-Mexican War. Mexicans don't like to talk about that war because they're ashamed they lost it. Americans are ashamed because they did it. And that, and that border that was created divided populations forever, but until recently, in the last 20 years. All right? so, but, so therefore, you have to deal with that population and the way in which most American institutions deal with, 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 with Mexicans either born in the United States or coming across the border. And that migration is a heck of a lot older than Mexicans, by the way, for about 300 AD. <laughs> you, know, you know that linguistically as well in terms of artifact. So you have that commodity framework that pops up every time you get into these contexts. Now, the difference is that you have individuals who, who perceive that that's not the framework that should be used, but rather one based on, 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 on justice and fairness for that individual. So that kind of commodity identity of, of the Mexican population is a peculiar type of racialism. It is not the kind of racialism that's used against African Americans. That's an entirely different history. So that the commodity identity is, is, is there constantly. And it doesn't, it, and it, one feels many times, I mean, my, you know, I, I, I feel it myself. I'm 100 years old, for God's sakes. You know, I served in the United States Marine Corps. I got shot at, blown up and everything else. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference. I still get a lot of crap 
within my own institution because of perceptions. And, and a kind of paternalism, a kind of, of uh, paternalism and, and uh, subordinating uh, relationships that people want to establish with you, especially administrators. That's there. It's for real. And I've tried to teach them, by the way. And these are highly rational people with PhDs. Thank you. I, I appreciate that <laughs> clarification. It helps me to understand to see how folklore does creep in and the stereotypes in the judicial system to make yeah. a different uh, perception, say, of a Hmong culture. Yeah, no, God, you know, yeah, but God bless folklore as well, by the way. <laughs> yes. We all, I think, really want to thank you for bringing examples of this richness and candor. Um, the last framework, I guess, question brings up uh, the question that I was going to ask. I wonder if part of our difficulty is not in the very fact that in framing ourselves as cultural experts, we're trapped in the same kind of identity jail as the people for whom we'd like to advocate. And it strikes me in both of your cases, you know, simply because culture is a euphemism mm -hmm. for race today. That's, and that tends to distract from other things. So it seems to me in your second case, you know, explaining what a tanda is is a hell of a lot less complicated than explaining how people get rich off of derivatives. Mm -hmm. uh, but we sort of assume that derivatives have to be understood. Uh, but, they're, but they're exotically attractive. Well, yes. It's a, I this guess is not exotically attractive. It's a different kind yeah. of exoticism, clearly. But in your, pre in your first example also, I was struck by the fact that you were called in to think about the cultural impact of forced sterilization on these women. And culture there seems to be very much obscuring the overwhelming fact of power, you know, forced sterilization on anybody, whether they are more traumatized or, you know, whether they have more resources to deal with it or not. It's still forced sterilization. And the analogy struck me with um, the US military today is working very hard to be culturally sensitive uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I've met some of these guys, and they're absolutely sincere about it. They really mean it. But those who are working hardest at it tend to forget the fact that, you know, whatever the correct greeting you give, I'm in full body armor and you're not. Yeah. Um, so the way that bringing us in to talk about culture, I wonder if we can find another language for yeah. what we do in these contexts that might not yeah. deviate if, the issue. Yeah, if, you, if you'll notice in the second power. case, I never used the word culture. I, I learned a hell of a lot in the 30 years. <laughs> I mean, that, that was, that was the, the, you're absolutely correct. That was the reference. That was the, 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 the conceptual reference that I was using as a brand new assistant professor, uh, having graduated out of UCSD, which itself was a highly cultural logical uh, shop. Uh, and if it had been for the training I got in, in Mexico at, at INA, at the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, I wouldn't have gotten a different kind of economic angle on stuff. So you're absolutely right. The, 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 like I said, the, the subcultural category was what I was using at that particular point in time. But if you'll notice, and all the rest, there's not a word about culture. What it is, it's process, uh, the distribution of behavior, uh, the best way in which people uh, utilize the scarce resources and funds of knowledge that they have. I, I, instead of culture, I, I use terms like funds of knowledge that Jim Greenberg and I kind of came up with in Tucson in about 1970, no, about 1983 or four, around in there. And it's been used in the schools now in, in a very effective way rather than using the word culture. Yeah, so I've changed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, uh, history screws us all. You know, it's, it's cumulative. <laughs> It's highly cumulative, and it's very difficult to get rid of a lot of the stuff that we've, that we have, we've acquired and we've accumulated. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Doctor, when did your book get published? Uh, this, this one, uh, uh, next year, I think. Yeah, in 2010. Yeah. I, I'm just waiting for my, my, my friend, Mario Garcia, to see this down there. Thank you very much, colleagues. <laughs>